Gosh, we've got lots of you joining us already. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so excited, more excited than you know, um, in terms of what we're going to share with you today and be able to connect with you all. Oh my goodness, we've got a hundred of you online already. This is absolutely incredible. Please say hello to us. We want to feel like we're <laughs> with you, whether it's in the office or whether you're at home today. Please just pop a, a hello and let us know how your day is going. Perhaps there's a word that summarizes your day most perfectly. Um, let us know how you're all doing. How is everybody? I'm, we are so, so, so oh to have Vancouver, Dublin, New Jersey, Madrid, London, Cologne, Elka, hello, darling. Oh, this <laughs> is Dallas, Suffolk. We are such a global community. And I know that all of us right now just sort of just feel that sense of connection and togetherness and that absolute understanding that we are not alone, amazing. which just feels amazing. Hi, guys. Welcome, welcome. What an amazing event this is. What an incredible event this is. Bonnie is the absolute best joy. I completely agree. Uh, <laughs> I could not agree more. So I, I feel like this is an international party and none of us yes. have to cook. It's, it it's feels like, like an best. international party. It feels like an international party. And we are just so thrilled to welcome you. We're going to give it a couple of minutes. Um, we're going to give it a couple of back. Minutes. We haven't done this in so long. Hi, Melissa. I know it's so good. Can't to be even back. remember. It felt like we were for a while doing this every couple of weeks, and I that know. felt super important to do during the pandemic. Yeah, we came together a lot, didn't we? But I think, I think sometimes you, yeah, you, we need, we need to be sort of more mindful of getting together more often when we can, because I know that the energy between the three of us and our shared value systems um, and different perspectives just always makes the conversation so interesting. Hi guys, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, well, welcome to, how lovely to see you. you. Wonderful to be with you all. So we're just welcoming, just gonna give it a couple more minutes as people are still joining us. And um, hi Maria from Coventry, good to see you. Hi Maria. I know, have you all been watching Lucy Brazier's travels all over the world in absolute awe? Because I know that both Bonnie and I have almost felt quite exhausted for you, Lucy, I have to say. And that is 100% true. <laughs> um, oh, bless you. It's the end of a month and I've got two more days to go and then we go back to Spain and I'm looking forward to being back in my little apartment by the sea, I have to say, but it's been wonderful. First time since COVID to do a big trip like this and meet Incredible, Bonnie. absolutely incredible. Lovely. I yes. see you having tea here and tea there. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can I just share that I went and had um, tea at Jamira Beach Hotel today. I think <gasps> it cost me about the same amount as a small mortgage, but it was <laughs> phenomenal. Absolutely <laughs> beautiful. Photos coming, photos oh, coming. Fantastic. But that was an EA, bless her, whose cousin worked there, who managed to uh, work the Oracle and get us in which was okay really so let's just get this straight like an, an assistant made that happen uh Vicky Evans and I were in New York a couple of weeks ago and an it was an assistant who got us into Funny Girl one of the hottest tickets in New York City and it was an assistant who got us into the taping of Stephen Colbert so power of assistance <laughs> those who <laughs> underestimate the power of the people on this call so don't know and they are they're lost they are. They are. In more ways than one, Bonnie. I've got no doubt about that. So this is being recorded. I think, <laughs> I think it's time we kick off. We've still got people joining us from all over the world. And let me just tell you, this is the power of this community, is the way we come together, that shared energy, that shared vision for the profession, and that deep understanding of the transformational impact that assistants have all over the world. And we know and today we're going to give you some amazing insights. So back in July, I was due to be on stage with these two amazing women, two complete sheroes of mine. And unfortunately, COVID bit me on the bum and, um, and, uh, and quite hard, I'll have you know. And um, I was really quite sick. So sadly, I wasn't able to share the stage. I watched it back 
and loved it. I love this session. And today we're going to bring it back from our three different perspectives. That's redefine, reimagine or resign. And we are going to give you our insights into the transformations happening in the profession right now from three totally different perspectives. And um, we're each gonna share what those look like from our world, uh, from, in our world. And then we're gonna invite as many questions as possible because we want to hear from you. And um, I'm going to, in just a moment, hand over to Lucy. Um, and uh, Lucy will then have the opportunity to bring all the rich insights from her global travels. And I know that you know who Lucy Brazier OBE and Bonnie Lowe Craven are, um, two shape-shifting, thought-leading powerhouse houses in the profession. And, and uh, I mean, yeah, both, both, I just feel so honored whenever I get the chance to hear their wisdom, and I know that you will too. Um, so just to introduce myself, and then perhaps Lucy and Bonnie can, can introduce themselves too, is I'm Lucy Chamberlain. I'm the really proud founder of CNC Search. We are an all-female team uh, of 25 women now based in the heart of London. And um, for the last 23 years, this has been my world. And I've probably interviewed over 24,000 assistants in that time. And so I know you and I know what you are capable of and I know what you are delivering to businesses every single day. And I'm gonna bring some of those perspectives um, to you in terms of changes that are happening, specifically probably from what I'm hearing from the clients that I'm, I'm working with really closely. Let me just hand over to Lucy and to Bonnie to introduce themselves before we start to hear Lucy's insights. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much, Lucy. And gosh, isn't it great to be back all yes. three of us together? I'm so excited for this afternoon. You might have gathered. Um, OK, I'm Lucy Brazier. I am the CEO of March and Publishing. We publish Executive Support Magazine. We do training. We do conferences. But that's a little part of it because somewhere along the line, I seem to get involved with campaigning. Um, on your behalf to help businesses to understand what it is that you do and what you're capable of and how best to utilize you. And uh, 2015, we launched um, a project called Global Skills Matrix, which came to fruition um, in September last year via the World Administrators Alliance, who are just the most fantastic organization who managed to drive it through. And um, since then, I've been talking to businesses all over the world about their assistance, and I am delighted today to be able to share with you some of that stuff. But we will move on to Bonnie, let her introduce herself, and then we shall come back again. Oh, such a thanks so much, Lucy. Such a joy to be here with Lucy and Lucy. That's my biggest challenge on these webinars is, <laughs> you know, Lucy C, Lucy B, like crazy. <laughs> Love seeing all the great names on the chat. Um, I am Bonnie Lowe Craman. I'm the author of Be the Ultimate Assistant. Uh, for 25 years, I worked as an assistant to Oscar winner Olympia Dukakis. And in a million years, I never thought that that work would end up taking me to 14 countries and 38 states. And many of those countries due to Lucy Brazier on this call today. So Lucy, thank you. I thank you every chance I get for opening my world to the world's assistance. Um, I spend my life in rooms of assistance and the leaders they support in the effort to build a better workplace. In my view, build an ultimate workplace or as close as we can get. And uh, for the last six years, along with all the work, I've been working on a new book, which is coming out in February of 2023. So really soon, and I'm gonna tell you more about that. Um, but my, what I'm very aware of is that there is still too much being unsaid in the workplace that needs to be exposed. The time for sitting back and waiting for others to do it is over. If we wanna shape what's coming next, we need to do it. That's what I've come to, so. That's who I am. Wonderful, Bonnie. And um, and I just can't wait to hear from you both. So I wanted to share just before we kick off, these two amazing women have contributed to this too, is today we would love to take this opportunity to um, raise some money um, for the Young Women's Trust who specifically work with women that are looking to get back to work 
but that for whatever reason have currently economic hardship, whether that's through domestic violence, whether that's through mental health issues, um, becoming a single parent. They work, they do the most amazing grassroots work. We have 22 just extraordinary prizes for you. Um, and that includes um, coaching, three coaching sessions with Bonnie. Um, it includes, I know that it includes a thousand pounds worth of, a thousand dollars um, worth of, um, a, of your amazing course, which anybody that's taken Bonnie's course, I know just how much you've benefited. And Lucy has contributed a ticket to any event, any exec sec event that, of your choosing. And there are so many more. There's beauty hampers, there's loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of stuff there. So Pippa, if you could put in the link, please, just so that if you feel called to and you're able to, um, it would be wonderful if you were able to enter the raffle and um, you can find more information about Bonnie and Lucy's prizes in detail in the link. Um, so Lucy B, I would love to hand over to you first, please. I'm taking my notes. <laughs> Thank Me you too. so much. And oh my goodness, that raffle is really amazing. I was looking at the prizes yesterday mm -hmm. and thinking, wow, 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 such amazing stuff on there. So go take a look. But I have good news for you today, really, because I feel like um, this new world of work for assistants is coming out of COVID, not too bad a place to be. I know how much you all hate change and you hate it because you feel out of control, but the whole world of work is out of control at the moment. It hasn't shaken down yet and we haven't worked out, worked out what it's going to look like when we get to the end of it. But the one thing that I'm absolutely sure of is that for the very first time, businesses are coming to me and are saying, you know, we have got to work out the return on investment of every single member of staff coming out of COVID. And for the very first time, we're going to have to work out what the return on investment and the value is of each assistant. And therefore, we need to work out how to do that. And we're not quite sure. So can you help us? Um, which is great, because I'm really enjoying having, having those conversations with them. Um, and of course, explaining to them how that works. But isn't it wonderful that they're suddenly waking up to understand that there is a real value to what it is that you do? Um, and for me, what I'm seeing is that they are asking some really burning questions for the very first time. Usually it's me suggesting to them how it's going to work. And those questions start with them wanting to know how they can create a structure for their administrative function, which means that they're bringing order to the relatively chaotic way in which assistants are currently employed and trained and promoted. And then they want to know how they're going to manage your performance so that they can make sure that it's based on opinion rather than fact. So it's stopped so that we're stopping it being based on opinion mm -hmm. rather than fact, because, of course, the at the moment, we've quite often got executives who are managing assistants who don't know anything about the administrative profession and tend to look at you and go, well, she's a nice girl and she's doing a really nice job managing my calendar. So, yes, let's give her a high score. That isn't where we are anymore. We're professionals. This is a profession and it's a career. And they're starting to wake up to that. They want to understand how the executives are going to use you properly. Hallelujah. How long have we been trying to get them to understand that? They also want to understand how they're going to align your skills with the needs of the business to make sure that the business is getting what it needs from each of you. And they want to ensure that there are clear goals and KPIs for assistance. Now, that's something that you're forever asking me. How do we set objectives for the year? What does that look like? And, you know, I always say to you when you ask me that, what are your executives goals and KPIs? Because surely if your role is to make them the best that they can possibly be, you should know how you are supporting them to get to what their goals and key performance indicators are. But the other two questions I think you should be asking them are what does success look like for you this year? And what are you trying to achieve? Because that will mean that you can get them to where they need to be. Now, I think it's really, really interesting that when we start talking to these businesses, we're finding that they are really rethinking 
how this assistant role looks. And one of the things that we are suggesting to them in particular is that they take a step back and they look at putting in a proper administrative function or department. And that may be an idea too far, although there are a lot who are at least thinking about it. But from my point of view, I think that when HR sit and try and work out whether they have covered everybody in the business, they almost have a checklist where they go, OK, we have um, covered the finance department and we've covered the sales department and marketing, tick, and finance, tick. But there's no assistant department on there because assistants are siloed. They work right the way across the business and you belong to all sorts of other departments. But what that means is that there is no structure. And I know some of you have got networks and networks are great, but networks tend to sit slightly outside of core business and they're seen as being, you know, lunch and learns and maybe not quite so serious. Whereas if businesses are to put departments in place, all of a sudden you have a structure just like every other department in the business. And that means that you have budget. It means that you have leadership and you have somebody at the top that everybody else looks at hopefully and says when I'm big I want to be that person so that when you come in at the beginning of your career there's a very very clear career progression and you understand what that looks like to take you to the top but what it also means is that there is performance review it means there's succession planning it means that for the very first time just like every other department in the entire business, there are goals and KPIs and you can be measured and they can tell you when you're being excellent. And that to me is so exciting. And all of that stuff ties into the global skills matrix. The global skills matrix being published in the middle of COVID was genius because what it meant was that the world of work just changed. This is just one more change. And at the exact right time, we have given the HR department the tools that they need to make sure that they are measuring you properly and that you can progress in your career in the way that we've always wanted you to. And that is my feedback. And I will take questions later on, but I am now going to hand over to Lucy Chamberlain, who is going to give her take on the world. Thank you so much, Lucy. And I know that for me, I've already taken away some lovely insights and I bet you have too. And I'd love to know what's surprising you. Um, I want to talk to you about some challenges we've got as a profession and we can't ignore them. The first one is we have a language issue. We have a language problem. And how we are talking about our profession and the language we are using is impacting how we are seen and viewed. One of the words that I'm hearing so much is I'm just an assistant. Still continuing today, I'm still hearing that word. I'm hearing the word I need to have a chat with my line manager, not I'm going to present a business case to my line manager. I'm hearing words like, I don't know, I just do everything that an assistant, all assistants do. No, you don't. You have unique expertise, each and every one of you. So the first thing I wanted to bring to your attention today to start thinking about is that we have a language problem and we ourselves need to take that on board and shift the dial in terms of how we talk about our meetings with our line managers, how we talk about our profession and developing a deep understanding of your unique brilliance. Taking that time to secure 360 feedback. What is it I'm delivering? What impact am I creating? What transformation have I supported? How am I aligning with your goals? and understanding the strategy of the organization you work for in order that your language can align. And that's one of the first things I wanted to bring to your attention. And I know that deeply because I've been working with some leading organizations and doing some coaching on a one-to-one -one basis for C-suite level EAs that are still using this language. And I want us to shift. I want us to shift. That was the first thing that I was going to talk to you about. The second thing is, is we need to be knocking on the doors of HR to say that this profession 
has a D, E and I issue. This is a diversity, equity and inclusion issue. Where is the training? Where is the development? Where is my individual development plan? Where is my career path? And we know now, thanks to the global skills matrix, that the document to support that is there. We have it. And within, within the global skills matrix, you have letters to HR. We can use that. But this is a DNI issue, okay? And it's really important that we start talking about it as such, because I, I do not see any other community or population organizations othered like this profession. And that is not gonna happen anymore if collectively we decide we've had enough. And I'm talking to organizations that we work with. I use my platform like Lucy and Bonnie do every single day to say, I am afraid if you do not have a development plan for your assistance, this is a DNI issue. If you do not have access to training, this is a DNI issue. If there are not proper reviews, this is a DNI issue. Because you can be damn sure there's nobody else in that organization that doesn't have access. That was the second thing I wanted to say. The third is mindset. I met with I met with two incredible individuals, and I know that Lisa won't mind me mentioning her name. So I got together recently with Lisa Nunn from an organization in the UK called Night Frank. They employ hundreds of people. I know that Lucy has also had conversations with Lisa about this. And back in the summer, I got to present a brand new career framework alongside Lisa. I had a very small part, but I got to present to their board. And they could not believe how transformational creating a career framework that had the ability for the individuals within it to create impact, influence, and to be a part of the strategic objectives of the business was going to have to their organization in terms of the caliber of individuals they were going to attract, in terms of untapped talent that the individuals had within it, in terms of empowerment, in terms of um, the sense of motivation within the community and hearing and seeing online individuals being promoted within that framework for me is deeply exciting. Beyond that, it shows it's possible within all organizations because organizations are delivering the global skills matrix now. And so if your organization wants to be seen as a thought leader, if it wants to be seen as, some, as an organization with integrity, again, we need to be talking top down, bottom up about the global skills matrix and the impact and influence and change it can make. But we do still have a mindset challenge. It's the last thing I'm gonna share. And um, for example, I met with somebody this week who is now traveling all over the world for a top executive. She's delivering projects events, strategy, board papers, supporting with pitch proposals, supporting with onboarding, recruitment, hiring. She hadn't had a pay rise. She'd been promoted without a pay rise. She was nervous about talking to her boss because she didn't want to be seen like a troublemaker or ungrateful. She didn't want to rock the boat was her exact words. And actually on a really deep level, it makes me feel emotional and bloody angry and if you are not angry you are not paying attention to what's going on because so there are so many cases where because we are not empowering each other and ourselves to own what we are delivering and to ask for what we deserve we are keeping ourselves small and we are allowing this whole framework to continue because we are unfortunately, active participants in it when we don't say what we need. Now, I know that takes courage. And I know that you can't simply develop the confidence for that overnight, but we can take the courage together to bring the systems together to talk about shift changes and needs that need to happen. So for me today, what I would urge you to do is to keep a celebration file, start to build up all of the thank yous that you've had, all of the impact that you have made, all of the actions that you've taken that have dropped to the bottom line in one way or another, or the projects you've been involved in, keep a note because these can be brought into then the opportunities that you have to talk to leadership about your role, about fair pay, about recognition and about development. We have to own our own 
profession. We have to self-parent and we've got to come together to really bash down those doors because they are still there. So for me today, I want you to know that you have limitless potential. We as a profession have limitless potential, but we have got to start using our voices and we've got to start focusing on our impact and our influence from a business perspective. Bonnie, over to you. You're on mute, you're on mute. <laughs> I didn't want my um, my bravos to interrupt you. Um, well done, Lucy and Lucy. Um, I know Lucy Brazier. You said that you know you brought a lot of good news to the to the event today. I feel like my piece of this is good news and bad news. That I too see some challenges, Lucy Chamberlain, um, not dissimilar to the ones you've mentioned. So I, I mentioned earlier that I was in New York a couple of weeks ago, and uh, what I was struck by was that it see, it reminded me of pre-pandemic. It was as if the pandemic had never happened. And I, it was, you know, busy and bustling and theaters filled and restaurants filled, but yet it is different, isn't it? We've all been through a lot in these last two and a half years. And it is in that landscape of all the volatility and all the changes that the assistants of the world are trying to function. And the assistants I work with that be the ultimate assistant and my clients all over mainly the United States are sharing that it is very fragmented right now that staffs are working, some are fully remote, most are hybrid and many assistants report that it is rare that everyone is in a room together at the same time and that has created a new dynamic so what piece of great news is the assistants of the world are still the backbone of the company and still the right arms to your leaders and you're doing it from a webcam you're doing it from perhaps thousands of miles away the bottom line is We've been through a lot here in the United States, um, and so have you know many of our friends in the UK. My goodness, you know the landscape, the you know the political picture is not divorced from what's happening in the workplace. We have to know that that we're impacted by that. So, what is going on? My my first point is about this hybrid virtual world we're in. And that there's a new trend emerging called proximity bias. Proximity bias is the phenomenon that those who are choosing to go into an office, if there is a brick and mortar office, are having a, 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 a heads up, a, a, no, a, they have an advantage over those who are choosing to not go into the office because they have proximity to the leadership. And we're in a profession that's still 93 to 97% female. And Lucy Chamberlain, I noticed your article online, which I hope you'll have a chance to talk to about today, about men in the workplace, men as assistants. And I think that's super interesting. But at this moment, like look at the chat, we're still a profession dominated by females and females, the data shows we still do nine hours more of housework a week. So many assistants, female assistants are saying, yeah, I, I love working at home. I love that. I get to be there for the kids and laundry, whatever. I'm not judging anybody for that. However, men, many men are choosing to go into the office and they have proximity to the leaders. And in the chat, I, I'm not keeping my eye on it, but I see it going a little crazy right now, but it's a thing. And so my, my message is that assistants, we need to be mindful and intentional about when and where and how we show up. And even if we're just showing up from the chest up, it's how are we showing up? Are we on webcam? We need to not be invisible. I'm worried about the invisibility factor. Um, and I don't want us to be invisible. Assistants need to be seen and heard and have your seat at the table, even if it's a virtual table. And you know what? Some great news is that assistants are doing that. And as a result of showing up and in all of this volatility, 
assistants are speaking up and I'm seeing uh, many assistants who have in, there's been a need in so many organizations to have someone who wrangles the administrative staff and that person, many of them are you, and you're raising your hand and saying, I want to be administrative lead. I want to be chief of staff. And that is happening. You are raising your hand and getting involved in onboarding systems because HR is, is overwhelmed. You are great at onboarding. You're getting involved in training. You're, some of you are great at training. Some of you are great at disaster planning because there is nobody who can say that more disasters are not going to happen to us. So that it's a it's a double-edged sword that we're dealing with right now. But because we're we're functioning virtually, it is imperative that we seek mentorship in order to show up the way that we really want to show up and to have the careers we want to have. The next point is about asking first. All of this change that's gone on, um, Vicki and I were just doing BTUA this past weekend in Jacksonville and a very interesting conversation came up that what leaders used to need from assistance has changed. And it cannot be assumed that their, their same uh, needs are the same. So it's important to take a fresh look at how we're operating in our workplace, even if you've been doing it for a really long time, even if you've been working with your particular leader for a really long time, it's about revisiting how you're operating given the new landscape we're in. So the, the whole idea is asking first, asking, you know, these are the priorities that I see for next week. And I would like to, you know, take my shot at working on X, Y, Z. Is that is that consistent with what you want? We need to, it can't be, we need to be proactive about having these conversations rather than waiting for us to react to how things are going down. What leaders are telling me is, Bonnie, the truth is, I don't really know how to do this totally. They're admitting that they are still being thrown by the, all the volatility of this workplace. And it just as the, if we have the global skills matrix to help um, put structure, the HR departments are realizing they need their own version of the global skills matrix. And so I believe we as assistants can help them do that. Um, last point is about being intentional about the pipeline pipeline of talent that so many of us are, if we're with our same companies that we were with pre-pandemic, then we know what that felt like to be in the office five days. And then we now, we live through the pandemic and now we're in a post-pandemic environment. But what about the new people? The assistants of the world who I speak with are concerned about the new people coming into our organizations, how to connect, how to build rapport, how to um, set the culture when you have people who are not in a room together. And so this is an opportunity for the assistance of the world to pay attention to who's going to be replacing us. This is our legacy about setting structure in place so that the future is secured. Um, we have a great opportunity to create the future that we believe needs to happen in our workplace. And whether that's manuals, um, onboarding systems that are not just in somebody's head, uh, we can no longer have a situation where assistants are walking around with all this institutional knowledge, otherwise known as tribal knowledge, and it's not documented in some way. So our workplace our, I believe our goal needs to be that we're going to leave our workplace better than the way we found it. So um, I've been working on this new book called Staff Matters. And here's what I've come to is that there's too much going unsaid in this workplace. 
too much that leaders don't know because they're so high up that there's a there's a sense they don't have time for it or they their middle managers and certainly assistants are not feeling agency to speak to upper management and that needs to change I, I'm what I'm wanting just to share is that this what I'm attempting to do in this book is bring these constituencies together that if we agree that there's a lot in the workplace that's broken we've got leaders we've got assistants support staff we have HR we have recruiters and we have we have business school professors who are trying to teach the leaders about what this thing is in this new workplace. I don't think that any one of those constituencies can fix what's broken alone. And there's too much alone still going on right now. And there's every reason to do this. You know, Lucy Brazier talked about talking to your HR, breaking down the door, and Lucy Chamberlain, same thing, is that we need to have this conversation. Because you know what? From the very first BTUA, there was a slide that said, assistants often know better. And yes, you do. That's my piece. Oh, goosebumps. And I cannot wait to read that book. I know that Pippa's just put the link in to sign up to the waiting list. And I, I'm, I'm going to be pre-ordering that. Um, Bonnie, thank you so much for always thank being you. so generous with your um, deep knowledge and wisdom and sharing that with us. And I couldn't agree more. I think I think we are still in a state of flux and I think things are moving and shifting. And I, and I agree with Lucy Brazier that this is an exciting time, but like all moments in time, they are only going to be exciting as if we come together to make shifts happen. And I think um, what I was going to add, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'd, we'd love to welcome um, uh, questions, but I thought it might be nice, perhaps myself, Lucy and Bonnie, just have a chance to sort of pass on any hints or tips or um, pieces of wisdom, having heard each other. And having listened to you, Bonnie, I, I, one of the most powerful things that I suggest to, um, to EAs is to send on a Friday, um, a Friday wrap up um, to their boss. This is what I've delivered. This is what my focus has been this week. This is what my focus is next week. What do I need to know? Because that way your boss has a sense that you are a professional with strategic focus, who has goals, who plans, who doesn't sit there waiting for the next flight to be coordinated or the next email to respond to. And it starts to shift your positioning as a strategic partner rather than a reactive assistant and I think that ability just in in terms of those small actions can lead to great change and so that Friday wrap-up email I think is very powerful if done impactfully succinctly and effectively and can really start to shift how you're viewed and I know that that yeah. this happened recently in a very large private equity firm and Hit the, the partner, who's a very challenging partner, actually got out of his seat and walked to the other end of the office because they happened to both be there and just said, thank you for letting me know the impact you are making because I don't say thank you enough. And it was because he saw it in his language. You know, he, he could, under, yeah. So that for me made a big difference. And, and, and I would share that with all of you. Lucy, B, what would you, what would you want to sort of add? You're on mute, Lucy. <laughs> there we go unmute um i wanted to uh just pick up on what you were saying about language because i think it's so important i often say that i think we should be teaching a class on how to speak business um and i say very often in my class you know the assistants are forever saying that they want to be treated as core business. They want to be treated as business partners. They want to be treated like everybody else. But so often they don't behave like it, mainly because they haven't persuaded themselves in their own head that that is who they are. And they are not speaking the language of business. And to me, the best way that they can get their head around that is to go and be part of leadership meetings. And of course, because so many of us are working from home now, well, whether you're in the office or whether you're working um, from home, having that conversation and saying, you know what, 
you don't have time to relay back to me what it is that you want me to do. Would it not be a good plan to have me sitting in on that meeting? Firstly, so that I can watch what you're agreeing to, so that I can take down information and I can make sure that you're then held to account and you're delivering on time. Secondly, to look at what everybody else is agreeing to do, to make sure that they're also delivering on time. Thirdly, so I can watch body language. So if anybody hasn't got it, I can make you aware of that. Mm -hmm. But also so I can see where there are bottlenecks coming down the line so I can get an education on what is happening within the business. So I can start to learn to speak the language of business and so that I'm able to get excited and inspired by what is happening within the business, as opposed to sitting outside it and having to run along behind you trying to get the information. The assistants that are having those conversations are finding that the executives do not have a problem with that at all and can I just be clear I'm not talking about you sitting in leadership meetings to take the minutes because you listen in an entirely different way when you do that but I think yeah. if you want to be core business and you want to speak the language of business there is no better way to learn than to go and do that to go and sit in and listen and very quickly I think they'll see you as part of the team as opposed to somebody who's sitting outside it but it's down to you to really make that shift and to think about yourself as core business as opposed to and I'm sorry to use the word but bleating about the fact that you're not seen in that way and not actually stepping up to the plate to make the change yeah um quick something to add to that uh love the idea of the and Desiree was questioning in the chat about Lucy Chamberlain's idea on the, the wrap up, the Friday wrap up. I say to my students, you can do it on Wednesday, you can do it on Thursday. It doesn't matter when you do it. I love the idea of, of telling your executives what you see as the priorities for the following week. And if you support two, three, four people, I'm a fan of having a category for each executive that they all see. So they all get the benefit of seeing what you're working on for the following week, because so many leaders, really, they're, most people are about themselves anyway. So they're not, they could easily think, well, my assistant is only doing work for me and not for anybody else. So I am a fan of sharing it with all, uh, with all the executives. I'm also a fan of the whole concept of sending the elevator back down sending the elevator back down for our colleagues. Um, this week, I, I posted something on LinkedIn that, you know, I, I usually get a lot of views, but this thing is up to 13,000 views. And it said, it was a graphic. Your circle should want you to win. Your circle should clap the loudest when you have good news. If they don't, get a new circle. And, you know, the reaction, the powerful reaction to that quote, those ideas is, it really spoke powerfully because it told me that many of us are walking around and do not feel supported. And, and we, we know what it feels like to not have support and we know, perhaps, hopefully we know what it feels like to have it. And if in the workplace, we're not getting the support we need. It is important, you know, to find a new circle or change the situation. I'm not a fan of, you know, very quickly quitting a job. That's not what I'm saying, but it is about stepping up and saying, this isn't right. I need, I want to affect a change here, that it's a new world and that we need to react and respond to what we need, that assistants have a right to say, I need this from you. I need this from my organization. And by the way, I wanna be a part of the solution. And I think that that point is an awesome one because ultimately as leaders, le you, the leadership teams want to solve challenges, want to solve problems and want to know if there are issues within their business in the vast majority. So if you can go to a leader with a challenge, with a solution and with the uh -huh. outcome and impact of that solution, the vast majority of leaders will want to make that happen. Because why wouldn't you want your business to do better, be better and people to be happier within it? 
But the problem is a lot of times you have those water cooler conversations. So the moans or the whinges or the frustration and then the resulting resentment without any uh, sort of, I, I guess, without any action taking place, it's actually going to create the change that you want to see. So where we have to shift from is a place of frustration into a place of action, but action aligned with what's best for the team, the business, the individuals, thinking about it from lots of different lenses. And when we do that, it makes all the difference, I think, to making change happen, um, because it needs to be a we, not an I. Yeah, from moving from the yeah, victim triangle into the empowered triangle is that essentially what I'm talking about. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think we had a question. So Lucy B, I think this is a good one. Let's come, let's come to you for this one first. So my chief of staff has taken my spot in meetings and isn't cascading information. What do I do next? I think it's important to understand that a chief of staff is a very, very different role from the EA. Um, and you are a very powerful triumvirate when the business uses you properly. So the chief of staff role is very much a senior vice president level. It is a role where you are facing inward to the business and managing the role of the, the rhythm of the business. You're uh, probably behaving as a stunt double for your executive, um, but it's very much strategy based. It's making sure that the business is working properly. So if you think about the three different roles, you've got the chief executive who's facing outwards and going out into the world and driving business. You've got the EA who is managing the day to day of the executive and making sure that they are functioning most efficiently and effectively. And then you've got the chief of staff who's looking inward and managing the rhythm of the business. And they should be working with the EA to make sure that the CEO is the most effective. I can give you a really good example of the difference actually very quickly, which is that as a CEO, if I was to go to my chief of staff and my EA and say, I want you to organize my travel plan for next year my chief of staff would probably look back over the last five years and go, where did she go that was most um, successful and where she made the most money? Where does she need to go because it's about relationships? Let me put together a briefing document. We would then talk about that. We would sign it off. And after it was done, it would go to my EA who would then make it happen in the best way possible. So if you're being left off those meetings, it isn't an either or. You need to be in there because you've got an entirely different role to the chief of staff. The chief of staff is looking at the entire business rhythm. They're not looking after the executive and what is best for them. So there is a very good argument to be saying, I know they're in there, but they are not a glorified EA. It's a totally different role. It's as different actually as me being a publisher and you being an EA. So you should definitely be in there as well. And I think there's a very good case for why you should be. Um, I couldn't agree more, could not agree more. Fantastic advice there, Lucy. And Bonnie, um, we have a, another question that's come to me directly, which is, how do I improve my ability to speak up? There are so many times when I want to say something mm -hmm. in a meeting and I think about it and then I just can't do it. I know that this is meaning that I'm not able to fill my full potential and I really want this to change. Any advice? Yeah, I do. And I am fully aware that this is a real challenge. It was a challenge when we were in a room together pre-pandemic, but it's really increasingly more complicated and more difficult when you're trying to do it like this. You know, the three of us knew how to look into a camera and, you know, we were doing webinars prior to the pandemic, but how many, you know, it was a learning curve. It's new. And the whole speak, I see this whole issue of speaking up as the number one issue in the global workplace that, that slows us down and stops us dead in our tracks. One suggestion would be in your one-on-one -on -one with your executive, you could simply ask and say, you know, choose your moment and say, you know, when we're in those meetings, I, you know, and give an example, you know, last week when you were talking about ABC, I actually wanted to bring up that idea or that what I knew about the project it would have, and somebody else said it, but I was ready to say it. How do you feel about me uh, speaking up in those meetings. Are you cool with it? Or 
you to simply ask. That's what I mean. Ask first, ask your leader how they feel about it. And I would venture to say that nine out of 10 executives are going to say, of course, say it, please say it. I want you to speak up, but it's important. So one of the reasons why we stay quiet is because we're not sure how it's going to be received. And when you're when you know you're on solid ground, you can test it out. Hopefully your leader will support you in that. I know Olympia Dukakis did that for me. She would say, hey, Bonds, what do you think about that? And then give me my opening. Um, but you would say, you know, I, I have something to add to that. And then and then be as succinct as you can be in a, in a meeting to, you know, I, I urge you to have baby steps take baby steps. I also urge you to find a mentor, someone who loves you and who has no other agenda other than they want you to succeed and practice with them. Because what is absolutely true is that when you, when you try it and you succeed in something small, it's cumulative and it builds and it gets bigger and better. And then and three meetings later, Jim in the meeting is going to say, Hey, Jill, um, weren't you working on that? What? Tell us what you're thinking. You know, we, I believe I've seen that happen with my own eyes and I suspect you have too. I hope that helps. I think that's supremely helpful. And I think just for everybody, remember that courage builds competence, creates confidence. Confidence is an eventual output from courage to take action. And for me, whenever I'm scared, of doing something or saying something or speaking up, I get myself into place of how am I being of service? And um, because when I'm of service, it doesn't matter about me or whether I look silly or whether it's not exactly what somebody needed to hear at that point. But when I'm being of service to the profession or being of service to my colleagues or my family, um, then that allows me to get out of my own way. So focus on that sense of service and that sense of service, every time you speak up, you're not just speaking up for yourself, you're speaking up for the whole profession and you are creating change in, in little increments. So but, um, Lucy B, we've got time for a couple more questions. I've been an admin assistant and an, ast and, and, a, and an assistant manager. I'm trying to make the leap to becoming an EA, but I keep thinking I don't have the skill set to match but I do seem to meet so much of the job role criteria. Hmm, that's got to be a woman because men don't think like that. Um, what, sh <laughs> what should I do, Lucy? What should you do? Well, firstly, and I'm sorry, I keep going back to it, but I would go look at the global skills matrix and see which level you're feeling that you are on that and then look at where the skills gaps are because you can see very clearly on the global skills matrix where the gaps are and if you are moving into an EA role you're moving from being a transactional assistant into being a um, strategic assistant and um, being more proactive and therefore you're moving if I'm thinking about it correctly from a level two to being a level three so what you want to do is to look at what skills you're going to need at a level three in order to be an EA so there's a senior EA level above that, a level four, but you really want to be moving into a level three. So look at where the skills gaps are and do that. If you're needing to talk to them about how you can get the training, what you need to be doing is putting together a business case for that. And I loved what Lucy was just saying about looking at where you serve, because I think that is a really good way of understanding your worth. But the other excellent way of understanding your worth is to understand what your contribution is. And they always think in terms of what the con contribution is, what they're interested in is what the contribution is to the executive and to the business. They're not particularly interested in what's in it for you. So I would be putting together a business case as to what it does for the business and what it does for your executive in terms of time saving and therefore in terms of cost saving. And I'm going to give you a really brief example here, okay, as a, as, as a way to do that. We were working out with a company quite recently who was introducing the global skills matrix. Now, bearing in mind their executives were on quite a lot of money, their entry level executives were on $160,000 a year because it's a scientific company. But we worked out that if the assistants were to save one hour a day extra by getting trained for their executives, then the company as a whole would save 
$88,600 a week. A week. Now that's with 500 assistants, but that is only with entry level managers. Only with entry level managers. That's before you look at what they're going to do in the time that's been saved for them. That's before you look at senior management and what the cost saving is on them. It's before you start looking at recruitment cost savings. It's before you start looking at finding superstar assistants. It's unbelievable. And, you know, I just think sometimes we forget that our job is to give our executives back their time. And when we do give them back their time, every hour of their time we give back drops directly to the bottom line. It's an hour of their salary that drops to the bottom line. So when you go and get training and you become more effective and you become more efficient, there is something in it for the business. And so, of course, that's how you need to be pitching it. So good luck. I hope you get to be the EA. If you want to talk to me about it, please feel free to email me and I'm very happy to go through it with you and to help you put that business case together because we've got some that are already kind of put together for um, courses that we do and you can go and take it and play with it and put it together for whatever it is that you're wanting to do. But good luck. Right. Okay, I can... a... Oh, sorry, buddy. Go ahead. Go ahead. There's a comment in the chat about and a manager who wants to bring the role back to the 1950s, um, which <laughs> the way we move forward in 2022 into 2023 is for the assistance of the world to put together a detailed, accurate job description of what you actually do. HR has no time to do it. They've told me that. They know that they are out of date. They know that your titles are not reflective of what you do. And they know that your compensation is not fair, but they're in chaos. I think it's still fair to say that many HR departments around the world still are. And so it'd be, if we're gonna make the business case to bring this profession into 2022, it is about putting in black and white what it is you actually do and the ways in which you are leveraged it makes, if in fact you're able to save your executive's time, just as Lucy Brazier was sharing, then your the return on investment of your salary will be evident. And and it historically we have not been great advocates for ourselves, but it is time. It is you know in light of the great resignation and companies struggling to find talent, uh, leaders are paying attention to these issues of 100%, I think. I think that is the perfect moment to draw to a close because we have been together for an hour. It's never long enough and it is never, ever, ever long enough. And I think we, I think what this tells me is we need to arrange another one of these sessions. There is so much more to cover and so much, so much more to share with you all. And we want, we really, really want to help support as many of you as we possibly can. Um, so we're going to just share with you a couple of things that we've got coming up, just the three of us. Um, and um, we will send two emails to you. The first one with all of our contact information, everything we've discussed today. Um, and then we'll come back to you with the recording in the next day or so. Um, so you'll have two emails following this. For me, the thing that I want to highlight most is raising money for the Young Women's Trust. So Pippa, please put that link in again. Um, but also, if you happen to be in London, we have seven spaces left on next Saturday um, for a whole day. And actually it's a reset retreat for assistance. It's specifically designed to help you reboot, reflect, relax, refocus. We've got four amazing session leaders. We run it at cost, so it's very, very reasonable. Um, and we'll share the details of that. Lucy B, have you got anything coming up that would be great to share with everybody? I mean, what a stupid question. What of the many <laughs> things that you've got coming up would you like to share with everybody in the session? How much session? time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> no, I should be very brief. Um, we're bringing Monday Assistant to Berlin. Um, in December, yes, yes. just in time for Christmas and all the Christmas markets. And Diana Brandle is joining me and is doing a full day. So it's wow. a three day modern day assistant, which we've never done before. But she is doing the future of work and um, technology and all that stuff. So I think that's going to be absolutely phenomenal. But um, the other thing is that Global is back next year, which is our online conference, which you may want to go and take a look at because right now the price is absolutely ridiculously low for 48 hours of training um and 
I guess that's it. There's plenty of other things. Go look at the website. Yeah. Those are the two <laughs> ones. We'll, we'll share as much as Lisa yeah. gives us. We'll share with everybody. Bonnie. The work, the work you're doing, both doing is amazing. Um, the our Be the Ultimate Assistant 2023 calendar will be coming out very shortly. Um, and the book, Staff Matters, People Focus Solutions for the Ultimate New Workplace is coming out in February of 2023. And this is my, my legacy project to do this with the workplace, to finally say the quiet things out loud. Um, I see a lot of gaps in the workplace, and this is, this is going to be my shot to help fix what's broken. So I have been talking about this and, and hope that uh, you all will support this and, and uh, take a hard look at what's going unsaid in this workplace. And the, the last thoughts I want to leave you with is, is this, if not now, when, and if not you, who, this is it. Olympia Dukakis would say, this is not a rehearsal. If not now, when, if not you, who, that's it. Well, I cannot follow that. So I am just going to say, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing space with us. Thank you for sharing your energy. And I know that that has just filled me up. So thank you, Lucy. And thank you, Bonnie, because I, I, that's just set me up for the rest of the week that has. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And so wonderful to see all of you there. Thank yes. you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time and share the replay. Let's share this information. Get this thing fixed. Yes. Thank you. Couldn't agree more. Take care, everybody. Have a great evening.